Welcome to another installment of In the Clock Tower. I'm Pastor Chris Byers of uh, St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful Gillette, Wisconsin. Glad to be here again for another uh, study as we continue on with our adult studies. Uh, this is just a recap of what we covered in the adult study this morning. Uh, and we'll do this each and every week because I want to keep you all connected for those who are unable to join us because of COVID or other reasons at this time. Uh, and I want you to be able to feel a part of this. This is the same study that our children and our youth studied in this morning's Sunday school class also. Uh, this is the adult version. We go with a little bit deeper themes, but they're very similar in the sense so that way there can be opening conversations between our youth and our adults in the church, which honestly we desire to have that intergenerational, especially as things settle down with all this COVID stuff going on and we continue to move uh, ahead, which will happen eventually. We'll get some level of normalcy back to us one of these days, I hope. Uh, but we're gonna we're studying Mary visits Elizabeth. You can actually download this uh, PDF uh, that I'll have linked onto the the video here, so that way you can be uh, follow along in here too. And hopefully you'll have some more discussion points. And if you have anything you want to add, of course, uh, feel free to do so. Just put it in the comments. Share what your thoughts are. You may have some insight somebody else doesn't have. And it could be a great opportunity to be able to have this discussion with one another because, of course, we, uh, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. Uh, as we come together in the Word of God, we can sharpen each other in our faith and in our understanding. So this is a great opportunity to continue to grow and help each other grow in our faith, too. I love the technology we have together. I'd like you to open your Bibles to Luke 1, verses 39 through 56. And as you do that, then... Uh, get yourself a moment. I'm going to go to my Logos, but uh, Logos problem uh, program that I have up here, uh, and we can read it together. Uh, but also, let us begin in prayer. Almighty God, you are the giver of all good things. Help us to be thankful for our many blessings and to trust you in all areas of our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, the introduction on this lesson starts out is, As proof of God's promise to Mary that she would bear a child, the angel Gabriel had told Mary that her cousin Elizabeth was also with child. This, too, was an amazing conception, since Elizabeth was well past childbearing age. When the women came together, they rejoiced at the favor God had shown them. So let us go. I'm going to move over to my uh, Lagos on there, and we will transition over on that. And uh, here we go. Uh, and we'll read this together. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So here we have a, a great account here as uh, uh, what Mary is saying uh, as she visits her cousin, uh, Elizabeth, on reading these verses, this is the question that they cover in the beginning there. Uh, on reading these verses, what are some of your initial impressions and questions? What stands out to you? A couple of things that were brought up in the class that did, really stood out to uh, to uh, many in the class was, uh, or 
was John left uh, John left in the womb of his mother. At at hearing the sound of Mary's voice, he was he was there. He 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 knew it was the Lord, and he leapt in the womb. Another is uh is that Elizabeth knew that Mary was pregnant, uh, which because obviously Mary wouldn't have been showing at this time. Uh, so there would only be one way that she would know, and I think we can find that when we look in the verses, because it says on there, it's beautiful on that, as Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, filled her with that knowledge there. Um, as we look at the bottom there in the biblical context on our worksheet, the word Advent means coming. The first couple of chapters of Luke and Matthew serve as a prologue to the story of Jesus, focusing on the time just before and shortly after Jesus' birth. This is what we refer to as Jesus' first coming, when God took on flesh and became incarnate as a human being. Jesus' second coming is when he will return again at the end of time. So in Advent, we remember his first coming, but at the same time, we are looking forward to his second. We know that Jesus is going to return. So this is, this is also a time of, pro, uh, of looking ahead for revelation to the ends. Uh, end time and all that, and looking towards the cross and all of that that has happened in there. As we are in Advent, we are preparing. We remember the first miracle, the great miracle, the greatest of all miracles. The Creator entered His own creation, uh, and so often we, we we may miss that as we 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 just think of a baby born in a manger and all that. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, you know this is something that we we want to remember that that it leads all to the cross and it leads to his return see jesus died for our sins right so uh let's go on to here i'm, I'm going to read that context a little more too, to finish that up scripture tells us that john's mother elizabeth and jesus's mother mary were relatives in luke 136 which makes jesus and john cousins both women experienced unexpected pre- pregnancies when Mary showed up at Elizabeth's home, it was likely a happy surprise. It is interesting that Elizabeth's unborn baby knew Mary's news even before Elizabeth did. This points forward to the way that John would prepare the way for Jesus and make him known. Now, one thing I did share in the class that I found striking in my preparations and study is is the understanding of uh, is this this. Um, dichotomy we have going on here this reference to the old testament thinking back looking back um it's in tradition it's understood is where elizabeth and zechariah were at would have been about where uh where the ark of the covenant got left um when uh, david was trying to return it to jerusalem and it got left at obed even edom and it blessed that place uh where they were so blessed in the period of time and here we have Mary that is coming as she is carrying the Son of God in her womb, similar to like an ark carrying the tablets and the holy things of God and the presence of God, which is Ark Covenant rep- represented is the Ark of the Promises of God. And uh and and how the three months that she was spent that, that the Ark of the Covenant sped in Od- Obed Edom brought blessing to that place. Uh, at that time, and how when Mary came for those three months, because they both were there three months, three months of Mary there brought great blessing to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, so she was there for probably about the time of when uh, John would have been born. Uh, the first question that we look at the discussion questions is, read the lead up to the story in Luke 31, 35 through 38. So we'll, we'll go back to my Logos. And we can look and see that lead up to that. Uh, as we as we read that here, it says, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So here we got a great blessing of, of what's uh, and a foretelling of what God is going to do. And uh, we have the Son, the Holy Spirit's coming, and it's telling her uh, to go. I mean, really, 
much of the reason that she would go is if we read, how did Mary and Elizabeth know each other? Well, they're relatives, so they would know each other being related with one another. Why would Mary have been motivated to go and see Elizabeth? Well, Elizabeth was pregnant, and that would have been an affirmation. She shouldn't have, in, in many people's eyes, it's a miracle she was pregnant because she was well past childbearing age. So that was a miracle in of itself. And then the fact that uh, when she goes there, you're going to find that, you know, there's affirmation that if God can do this to Elizabeth, of course, God can do this to Mary. So it's affirmation that God is going to fulfill that promise uh, to Mary also. And how would this serve to confirm the promise made Mary herself? I just spoke of that there because, of course, I mean, this would affirm saying, you know, one of the great things is, is sometimes we focus so much on the miracle that Mary, that God could create a, a child in the womb of a, of a virgin. Well, that's really not a great miracle. The miracle is, is God entered his own creation. Uh, God became one with us. He became like us. That's a great miracle in and of itself. Uh, that would be the greater of the two miracles. So the next section of questions we have here in the second one here says, which couple was older, Mary and Joseph or Zechariah and Elizabeth? Well, both Zechariah and Elizabeth were older than normal childbearing age. So, of course, with that, Mary and Joseph were at the beginning. Mary was probably about 15. Joseph uh, wouldn't have, would have been a little older, probably. But uh, Mary, you know, this was right at the time where she would have been ready for having children, uh, looking forward to having children. She was betrothed. She was going to marry Joseph. This was not part of the plan, uh, but she was looking ahead to what would happen and that she would have a child uh, with him eventually. But now here she's with child from the Holy Spirit, from God. So we have this as a clear uh, indicator of what God, how God is working and what God can do. And uh, so let's... Uh, uh, so we know that. Why were each of these pregnancies something unique and special? Well, of course, uh, you know, for Elizabeth, the fact she was well beyond childbearing age, which would mean she had stopped having those normal functions that women would have uh, that could have a child. Uh, so she wasn't having those normal functions. And, and uh, you know, well, Mary, she was a virgin. She hadn't done anything. So that wasn't something she had never known a man. To use biblical parlance there. So uh, so this was a scandal in the sense for Mary uh, because, well, she shouldn't be with child, but God desired for her to carry his child, his son, uh, and God let that made that happen. Um, now, the third question is, what was it that caused Elizabeth to cry out upon seeing Mary? Well, John, her son, leapt in her womb. Uh, and uh, how uh, how is this uh, similar to the way God worked through the prophets of old? Well, John leapt in her womb. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, as what we read as we look through. Uh, I'll pull that up here. It says here, uh, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she did with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And cries out with that great blessing. But see, the Holy Spirit is what let her know um, that she was that that who Mary was. I mean, without the Holy Spirit, she had it wouldn't have it wouldn't have moved her in any way, shape, or form. So when we think about what the Holy Spirit's doing, how the Holy Spirit can work, that can do the same for us. The Holy Spirit is constantly opening us to understand who God is and what God is doing. Now, the second thing it says on there is compare, and also this prophecy would come true uh, in the sense that, um, you know, Elizabeth had been known that had known that uh, she was pregnant, but she knew that it came through God's promises. Now, hers was the natural, through the natural way, um, but it was also a fulfillment of the promise of God. Now, when we look at 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 21, um, you know, uh, it says here, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So without the power of the Holy Spirit, no prophecy can ever come true. We cannot make 
prophecy happen, right? Um, it only happens because God wills it to happen. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure that there was many a time that Elizabeth had desired to have a child, um, but um, she was unable to conceive. That was, she could not will her own conception, right? Uh, she had to, but it was through God and God and his promises and God and his promises alone in which she was given this great and glorious blessing on which she could conceive her child. And she did. Uh, she conceived John. Now, John had a very special blessing ahead of him. Um, now, she probably didn't know the fullness of what that would mean. I'm sure it would have brought great grief to her spirit. But it wasn't her work. It wasn't her action. It was God's working in her, through her, like God can do the same in us and through us. And God did through all the prophets prior. You know, no prophet could ever turn. I mean, it's so often, you know, you think about this. She had to say the things she said, probably because the Holy Spirit was so heavily upon her, there was nothing else she could say. Um, and it's amazing how that how God's word works that way. Um, so who is the person Elizabeth refers to as my Lord in verse 43? Had she ever met this person? Well, when we look at the scriptures, we're going to find in verse 43, she says, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Well, the Lord that she is referring to, of course, would be Jesus, right? Now, this is a special term. It's nothing abnormal of, of use at the time, but it does, usually you wouldn't say that about a baby in the womb. I do want to say one thing, and this is a, a textual note that came to me here, and I want to share, because much of this uh, can be lost in our world. And I did highlight this, and I brought this out in class too, uh, because it really struck me. Uh, in our world today, and especially sometimes how people try and make it seem uh, like, you know, especially in our debates for life and all that, I want to bring out uh, this this lesson this here on the as I was looking through and studying on this uh, and talking about there's a Greek word that is used and I'm gonna put it in verse 41 and the word baby, uh, brephos, as we find here, um, and that is also right here, and talking about it means. Baby infant is used for babies both before and after birth, implying that an unborn child is a fully human person. The word occurs eight times in the New Testament, six of which are in Luke through Acts. It refers to John the Baptist while in his mother's womb in Luke 1, 41 and 44, to Jesus after his birth in Luke 2, verse 12 and verse 16, to the young children brought to Jesus in Luke 18, verse 15, and to newborn babies in Acts 7, verse 19, 1 Peter, verse 22. And St. Paul describes Timothy as knowing the scriptures, apobrephus, from the time he was an infant, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. The biblical usage of this term has important ramifications for human life issues. It supports even mandates, a concern for the sanctity of human life from conception onward, and makes disregard for such life morally reprehensible. Now, the only reason I bring this up is I am very strongly pro-life, and I know so many uh, in, in the church are too. And one of the things, uh, as we live in our age today, some of the things that are, are used to try and justify, especially those that are in the church that want to feel it's okay to justify abortion and the like, is that there was a different understanding, supposedly, in ancient people of what was in the womb and understanding what, what true life is and what conception is. Um, you know, I mean, even today, they, they, they make conception something different. So you have to sometimes actually even instead of using the word conception, you'd say fertilization, which also seems such a sterile term. But when there is a baby in the womb, a baby in the womb is a baby. A baby outside of the womb is a baby. And that was understood by the Greeks, who had a very different understanding of the importance and value of life. And being one who is pro-life personally, I believe that we should protect life from conception or fertilization all the way 
through natural death. That is my opinion, uh, and I hold that to be uh, an important and vital thing. Uh, I'm not, and this is not uh, some uh, judgment for those who believe in capital punishment and all of that. I'm not going to speak to that, but I'm going to tell you, if we are using the Bible, let us be honest about what the Bible says. When we speak about the Bible uh, and we talk about these, this section right over here that I have highlighted, this section, as, as we go through that, it's important that we realize in Scripture that the Bible does also define for us life and what a baby means, what it means to be a baby. And that does not just extend to once that child is outside of the mother's womb, but also to when that child is in the mother's womb. There is no difference biblically between a baby and a fetus. That is a reality biblically. Um, so that's just my point there, because I am so pro-life, but I, and, and I do, and I think for those that fall into the lie of abortion, there is there needs to be help. There is salvation still available, and, and God still can find it and forgive. Uh, it's just something that we just should be very honest about as people of God, knowing that this forgiveness that God gives us is something that is so free and so freeing even when we make mistakes, even when there are errors in our living and in our life, God forgives us. So it's something I hope that there can be hope, that, that, that we can give hope to those who are caught in this lie. Um, and we just need to give the hope of Jesus, that our, our leader, our Lord and our creator entered creation so that we can know salvation. Um, and, uh, and see, even in the womb, even in the womb, Jesus was Lord. He is God. Uh, even before Elizabeth met him. So, and she knew that. Now, the fifth question on this question is the poetic passage in verses 46 through 55 are known as the Magnificat from the word magnify. What is the overarching theme of these verses and why do you think these words have been set to music so often in Christian history? Can you find these words in your church's hymnal? Here, I'm going to switch back over and we can look through those verses here. But I want to say here, this is the Magnificat and we sing it. Uh, I love that we're singing it through this uh, Advent season. Uh, we're using Holden Evening Prayer, which is so beautiful. I like how Marty Haugen has put that together. And... Uh, and it does, and it's so easily sung, but it also it resonates deep within our hearts, within our soul, within our spirits. It's been remade throughout a lot. It's very similar to uh, prayers and things that were sung in the Old Testament. Uh, much of these are, you can see parallels to things that have been sung about in the Old Testament there too. Uh, the overarching thing is what God has done and what God has shown. He has looked on the humble estate. So often we'd like to, some would like to focus so much on Mary that they might miss out on the fact that Mary is pointing totally to God. And it's not her heart magnifies the Lord. It's not her life magnifies the Lord. It's not anything but my soul magnifies the Lord. Uh, gosh, I don't know why that did that. I'm going to pull this in over a little more here. Sorry about that. But she says, my soul, and I'm not, ah, stop. Uh, I'm trying to highlight this for you. But it says, my soul magnifies the Lord. You see that right there. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My Savior. It's every bit of her being magnifies God. And that's how we are called to be also in our lives. If we were to look at this and, 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 and think of those of us that think we're of high estate, we should really look at the Magnificat more and more because we should be humbled in that. See, he exalt, he brings down the mighty from their thrones and exalts those of humble estate, fills the hungry with good things and the rich. He has sent away empty. If, we can do things on our own. We don't need God. And that's an important aspect that we should really look to in this. Now, I wanted to go here. I'm going to go to a page here that of what I'm uh, of what Luther kind of said. And I think really encapsulates one thing that I think we should really look for in our own living in our life together. 
uh, with God. And sometimes we miss this in our in our Christian understanding because as our Western understanding of our faith sometimes colors how we believe. Uh, most people, I'd say, uh, can finish this statement. I said this in church, and I'll say it over. You know, everybody can say it. And, you know, it says, God helps those who help themselves. Some people believe that's a biblical concept, but the reality is it's not. It's actually contrary to the Word of God. It truly is. Um, Luther said, and I think encapsulates the true biblical understanding in just this one sentence right here that I I, I just struck me as I was studying and reading and preparing. For where man's strength begins, God's strength ends. For where man's strength begins, where we think we can do it on our own, God's strength ends. Because God is do more. If we we can do it on our own or believe we can do it on our own, God is not going to intervene. He'll let us do that. I described it in service this morning as that, uh, you know, basically, if you were to give a child uh, and say they want to they want to do it, which a lot of kids do, I want to do it. I want to do it. Let me do it. And uh, give them a gallon of some liquid to drink and they want to do it. They want to pour. What's going to happen is they'll probably knock over the glass. They'll spill. They'll make a mess. And they'll look at you like, why did you let me do that? And and they'll, they'll give you that there. But and I, I just love that for where man's strength begins, God's strength ends, is a, is a reminder of saying that we need to quit being like that little child and, and turn to God. Now, you know, like one described today to me, I think uh, as she was coming out, Ruth said, uh, she looked at me and said, oh, I understand. I let my three-year-old, I help them, though. I hold it and we pour together. See, I think that's how God really works with us is when we, when we realize we cannot do it on our own, God is there. He will use us. He can use us. It doesn't mean we just give up and say, I can't do anything, so God, you just do it all. No, 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 no. God will work in and with us to do those things which he wills. Uh, he wants us to work. He wants us to give up, in essence, and let him work through us. So often we like to try and act like we do it on our own and get, take the glory ourselves. But God is the one who wants the glory. And he wants to show and glorify himself through us in our weakness where people go, wow. You know, and one, one thing I would say, you know, I, I believe strongly in prayer. And I have prayed with a lot of people. Uh, and, I, and I'll be saying, I'll say there have been people I have prayed over and I have seen God heal them. I've seen God restore them. And there have been people I've prayed over and I've seen God heal them by taking them home. I would love to say that every time I prayed over someone, even with, even in my heart, and I, I just was so desiring for them to be able to, for them to be healed, for them to feel, uh, to be fully restored in the way that I wanted them to be restored. And, you know, it's hard uh, to, because, of course, I'd love to, I don't like to see people I care about suffer. I don't like to see that. Um, and you know, I know Paul struggled with the same thing. He didn't heal everybody he prayed over. Uh, and I do believe in the power of prayer, just laying on hands and, 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 and doing what, and just doing what God asks us to do. And sometimes, you know, you get to see, you get, you get blessed to see the great and glorious miracle of God healing. Now, if I were to, if I were to try and act as though it was anything that I was doing, I, I'm being foolish. I, there's nothing that I do uh, in that. God just uses. He works through me. He can work. He, he works through others in the same way, in the same fashion. Laying hands on people and just praying and just giving it over to God, laying it at His feet, and let God do what God does. That's where. That's where His strength is in there. The power is there. It's not me. It's not you. It's not any of those. There are those, uh, snake oil people that do false and they do these healings. Uh, you know, biggest thing is, is, you know, they talk about these great big tent revivals and all the healings that they do and people fall over slain in the spirit or all of a sudden people get up and walk and uh, you just send them more money, uh, send them more money and they'll bring you that healing. They'll bring you that blessing. Uh, no, uh, that's not what God does, and that's not how it should ever be used in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I Do I believe that sometimes there are people that are healed by somebody laying on hands, even some of those snake oil people? Sure, God can work through them, 
but not all the time. And that's the point. It's not about them. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing. It's God's actions. It's God's work. And that is a gift that God can give to whomever he desires to give it to. He can also take it away uh, if it's something of abuse. If you have the gift of healing that uh, as the gifts that are spiritual gifts that are out there, you know, that's something that God can use you to do through others. Uh, but that's not something that you can always, you can just command on your own all the time. And uh, I, I think, and if you start to do it for your own glory, God's going to take it away. <laughs> God's not going to sit there and go, oh yeah, you're, you know, you're a fake healer. You're, you're, you're somebody you need to be prayed over yourself. Uh, you're a deceiver. Um, and that's something to be very careful on. So where man's strength begins, God's strength ends. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so that comes back to their saying, you know, we think about the hymnal, you can find a lot of hymns with the Magnificat. Um, who is the primary actor in verses 46 through 55? How is this also the case in our relationship with God? In what way does this tie back to the same definition of grace found in the angel's first greeting to Mary? Greetings, O favored one. Um, and, and this is God is the actor here. We need to give the glory where the glory belongs. God is the actor. We're passive when it comes to our salvation. We're passive when it comes to uh, our hearts being turned. It's and, and, and we're passive when it even comes to the fullness of the miracles that God will perform. Uh, when we are doing the prayers and the work there, we're still passive because it's really not our action that's bringing healing. It's God and God alone that brings that healing. There is no action that we have to force that. We cannot just say, God, you're going to do this or else. No, not at all. It's all God. It's all what God is doing. It's all God's power, all God's might. It's who God is. And that's where we just, that's, that's the, that's just, I, I can't stress that enough. And Luther had a hard time when it talked to the, the greetings, O favored one. That's a good translation. English Standard Version translated modern. A lot of modern, say, tra, tra, modern translations do. You know, the older translations would say, Hail Mary, full of grace, which we know that prayer. There's nothing really wrong with that prayer except one thing. It sometimes it can be it can cause one to look away from the primary target. Mary isn't the one to whom we are called to pray. Jesus is the one to whom we are called to pray. When the angel gave this greeting, it wasn't as though she was he, the angel was saying, "You are the most holy one." No, no, no. Uh it's, it, it should have been, and Luther argued this in his day, and I would say it's the same still today, is he said it, he said it would be better to translate it into German, would you say, use the word Liebe, Liebe Marium, Liebe Marium, which if I were to write a letter to my wife, I would say Liebe Don. You can say my love or dear would be the other way of saying it. Uh, dear Don. Or greetings, greetings, Miriam, dear Miriam, dear Mary. And that would be, and that's a, that's a, that's a very positive way of showing that it's not Mary that's the object here. It's not Mary who's the most important one here. It's not Mary which is the, Mary is the subject of a greeting, but Mary is not, is not, is not set apart in the sense that she's holier than everyone else. She is blessed. She's favored. God has chosen her for something very special. Yes, indeed, that is true. There, It is something very, very special, which, which we are seeing that God is doing. But that is not something which we need to, we need to look at and say, well, you know, let's, let's start praying to Mary. Uh, let's, let's bow down to Mary. She is not the mediatrix. Uh, we have one mediator, Jesus Christ. He is our God. He is the Son. We pray. We can pray to Jesus. And He is, and that is who our prayers should be directed Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You can use the name of 
You know, that's when Jesus says, baptize in my name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, that is, so that is pointing to God. We only pray to God. There is nothing more that we need to do or no one else we should. Praying to saints and the like, it's, why? I mean, yes, we can pray for intercessions. We ask for intercessions for others, from others, you know, say, pray for me. Yeah, well, we're asking others to pray for us. That doesn't mean we don't pray too. It means we ask them to pray to God for us. It's not their power of their prayers that's going to do anything more than our prayers. It's just expanding the number of people praying to God, offering a petition for each and every one of us. And that's just, and that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just sometimes we, 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 we keep our eyes off the main target. And the main target is not Mary. The main target is not us. The main target is our Lord, right? Now, the blessings that God gives, that's targeted to all of us, right? Um, we want God to bless our loved ones. We want God to bless our homes. We want God to bless our church. We want God to bless our communities. We want God to bless our nation. We want God to bless the world. We want God's blessings to fall on everyone, and we pray for everyone. Uh, and and that is, you know, that is where we, we, we ask God to be. He is the... He is our object, or the one to whom we pray. He's the subject to whom we pray. And everything else is the subjects, the object to whom we pray for or the subject to whom we pray for. We are seeking the, those prayers to go out, and God uses us in there. Again, it just reminds us before where man's strength begins, God's strength ends. Where man's strength begins, God's strength ends. So remember, the more we do it for our, on our own, the more we are on our own, right? The more we let God, we give it over to God and let God work through us, the more God is working through us, the more God can do through us. Um, so was Mary chosen because she was better than all other young women of that time? And how do Mary's own words in the Magnificat express her thoughts on that question? Well, that's easily when we look right to the, the, the text itself and we look, Merit, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. See, Mary was, Mary was not, a, even though there is extra biblical writings you can read in the Proto-Evangelion of James that uh, tries to paint Mary as being like the daughter of of a priest and a and a highly regarded woman within within the community, and it paints this whole big picture. And the immaculate conception of Mary is, or immaculate conception speaks to the conception of Mary, who says the mother Anna, Saint Anna, uh, her womb was made ready to carry the one that would be the Theotokos, the bearer of the Son of God. So it was all this, but it's not biblical. It's extra biblical and it wasn't written prior to the birth of Jesus it was written well after it's not it's part of a, there's a tradition that that that's grown from it but it's really not part of the bible it's not part of the canon of scripture uh and it is more of just a fanciful tale so i i don't put any weight in that and it's unnecessary because it's putting the focus on the wrong thing mary and then it puts the focus on Anna and Jochen, uh, the, the parents of, of Mary, who those are figures that aren't spoken of throughout Scripture. <laughs> They're not in there. Um, those come from an extra biblical tradition. Um, but at the time, I mean, we don't know really anything about Mary's parents. We don't know much about her background other than she is of, we know that she's also of the line of David as is Joseph. They're, 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 they're distant relatives, so to speak. But then again, all of us are distant relatives. But she, they both come, they both can trace their lines to, uh, to David. Um, that makes them both, uh, that makes it where he is of the throne of David. And we know that there is, there, that they were, they, they, they weren't high positioned people though they they weren't highly positioned in the time in the in the 
in the society of the day and they didn't live in a they lived didn't live in a great city nazareth was kind of a backwater area so it wasn't as though they were living in in high highfalutin ways right um we don't i mean we don't know mary could have been an orphan at that time we don't know um she might have been serving as a servant um a simple girl doing simple things uh but see, her life is not the most important part other than, no, she wasn't a high priest's, she wasn't one of the priest's daughters. She wasn't uh, highly regarded in the temple. She wasn't somebody that was a very highly known figure in the world. She was somebody that uh, most people wouldn't even notice probably. Uh, may not have even looked one way or the other with her. She might have been a very sweet girl. She had probably strong faith. Uh, We could be certain of that because God was using her. But all of those things, we just, those are, those are less important than the fact that God was using her to do something so great and so wonderful as God can use us to do also in being a great example to others of the faith. And ultimately that is the most important thing is that God can use Mary. God can use us. God can use the most imperfect. God can use the, 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 the most lowly in the eyes of the society. It's, it's, all how, it's all what God's desires are and what God desires to do and how he can use us. And that's, that's the most important thing that we should carry out in our faith and our lives, remembering that we are created wonderfully in the image of God. We are created for something better. We are created more for more than what we see in our world here and now. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter where we stand in society. It doesn't even matter what our last name is uh, and our history of our family is. God, God is less worried about all of that. Those are things that the world tends to worry about. God is worried about, God looks at our heart, our soul, our spirit. And even if we're, even sometimes he'll see, well, we know he'll see things in us that we don't see. And that is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And trusting in what God can do in our lives as we continue to turn it more over and over to him. We can find hope, we can find joy, and we can know his salvation and live it out to the fullest. That is that is the great miracle we see. And looking at what Elizabeth saw in, in that and remembering here we have the, the blessing that is there and it's known. Once we feel the blessing in our lives, just let it fill you and be a blessing to others ultimately. In this, I hope that you are you are lifted up and as you're preparing, as we enter into the final, we're on this final stretch of Advent and we're going to be, no, before we know it, we're in Christmas and we're celebrating this birth, this miracle that God had done. Uh, as we do that, just let your prayers and your hearts be drawn ever closer to our Lord and our Savior, trusting in his mercy and his care. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the blessings that you give to us. We ask you, Lord, to continue to pour your Spirit upon us, that we may be guided in your strength, trusting ever in your mercy and your care, knowing that you are our Lord. You are great and you are wonderful. We trust in you in all things, and to you we lift our hearts in this prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have yourself a great rest of your week. I hope to see you on Tuesday as I put up Christ over coffee. I hope you quite enjoy that. Again, just comment in the comments area if you have any questions, thoughts, things to share with others that may be also viewing this so that maybe there could be things that uh, you might offer that uh, may lift another up as we grow together in the faith and study his word. All right. Until I see you again, God bless. (music) 